Hallelujah. Thank you, Gabriel Priesty, for that wonderful praise. Now, at this time, I'd like to uh, share a message entitled The Father of Jesus Christ through John chapter 5, verse 17 through 23. The Father of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came into this world, he proclaimed the new word. That is why he said you must put wine, new wine in new wineskin. New wine here is his new word. And if you look at Mark chapter 1, verse 27, it says they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So even others who um, heard of his teaching acknowledged that this word was new. It was new word. And one of the things that was especially unique in his teaching was the name he used for God. Jesus called God what? His father, right? Jesus always called God his father. Jesus loved to call God his father. But in today's text, the Jews wanted to kill Jesus because he called God his father. Right? This was in John chapter 5, verse 18, as we just read. So why? Didn't the Israelites call God their father too? So why is this so surprising? Why is it so shocking to the Israelites for Jesus to call God his father? Even in the Old Testament, it clearly states that it clearly calls God father. So today we are going to study about the difference between Jesus' use of the name father and the Israelites' concept of God as father. First, the Israelites' concept of God as father. Let's look at that. The Israelites' concept of God as Father. So, what did the Jews view God as? First, the Jews believed that God was the Father of the nation of Israel. So the Jews, they believed that God was the father of the nation of the Israel, of Israel, but not the individual Israelites' father. They only believed God as the father of the nation, but not in an individual um, aspect. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse, one, uh, verse 9, it says, With weeping they, all, they will come. And by supplication, I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of water on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So it says right here, I am a father to Israel. So the Israelites thought that he's just a father to the nation. So when referring to God, they use the expression, our father. In the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, they use our father. That expression, our father. But the expression, my father, appears only three times in the Old Testament. And when you look at these scriptures, Psalm chapter 89, verse 26 is one of them. It says here, he will cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Well, here, this is Psalm chapter 89 is what you call a messianic psalm. So basically what this means is it is prophesying about the coming Messiah. How he, the Messiah, will call God my father. So the Jews knew this, that the Messiah will call God his father, my father. And then... In Jeremiah 
chapter 3, verse 4, it says here, Have you not just now called to me my father? So this is God saying to the Israelites, Why are you not calling me my father? I'm your father. So all of these three uh, scriptures with the expression my father is not something that the Israelites themselves uh, spoke. It's what God said. So God has been, and Jesus, he has been, teaching that God is the father of each and every one of us. That he is the father of the Israelites individually. But the Jews did not take it in the same way. And second, many points, they thought of God as the father of all creation. They thought of God as the father of all creation. Why? Because he created all things, right? Because he is the creator. But in the Bible, it doesn't teach that, if you look carefully. He is, yes, the creator, but he's not the father of all of his creation. That's the difference. That's why if you look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, it says here, Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? So Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying here to his disciples, that even the birds, your Father is feeding them. So imagine if God was the father of all creation, Jesus wouldn't have said your heavenly father. He would have said the bird's father. Right? So Jesus is clearly distinguishing the birds and his, and his disciples. And then our mini point number three, they thought of God as the father of all mankind. They thought of God as the father of all mankind. Even nowadays, peop many uh, Christians think this way, right? Even other religions think that God is the father of all mankind. So if you look at Acts chapter 17, verse 8 to 29, Apostle Paul speaks here, For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said. For we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. So it says here, that he is their father. So the Israelites also thought that God is the father of all mankind. In Exodus chapter 4 verse 22 says here, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So the Israelites thought that only the people, only the Israelites were his were God's firstborn, while the Gentiles were not. But if you look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus says, here, For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Uh, here, again, Jesus is distinguishing the Gentiles and his disciples. Your heavenly father, he says. So this is also saying that God is not the father 
of all the Gentiles. Yes, God is the creator, but he's not the father of all of his creation. So the beasts, the birds, the Gentiles, those who uh, revoke against God's people, all of these people, the sun, I mean, um, all, these, all these creations, God does not um, treat differently. He provides sun, he provides rain to all things equally. Even the fact that the sun and the moon don't clash together, that is through God's grace. So God's grace is poured upon everyone, righteous or unrighteous. He pours it equally upon everyone. But that doesn't mean that he's the father of everyone or everything. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 through 45, it says here, But I say to you, love your neighbors and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So what does this mean? God will treat the evil and the good. He will, just as he pours upon his son and, the, and his reign onto the evil and the good, same thing. You also treat your loved ones and your enemies the same. Jesus said, God is your father, right? Not the father of all things, father of all creation. So these Jews, they had this impression that they were um, the priests, that they were the firstborn, that they only God like them. But what did Jesus say? In John, this is what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 41 to 42. You are doing the deeds of your father. Here, you of your father is not talking about God, the father. He's talking about the, the devil. They said to him, we were not born of fornication, fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. So the Jews here are saying, we have one father, that's God. But what, did, what does Jesus say? He says here, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own in, I, initiative, but he sent me. So he's saying basically your father, the father that you think is your father, is not God. And then in John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, You are of your father, the devil. He's saying your father is the devil. That's what Jesus says, upright. So Jesus is basically saying that God is not even the father of the Israelites. Then let's look at our big point number two. God the father that Jesus taught. God the father that Jesus taught. So who is the father that Jesus teaches? Who is the true father? Whose father is God? First, God is Jesus' father. Definitely, right? God is Jesus' father. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And second, God is the father of all who believe in Jesus. So God is whose father? He's the father of all of those who believe in Jesus. 
In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, it says here, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons and daughters of God. If you're outside of Christ, then God is not your father. He's just, some, he's just the creator to you. And third, God is the father of those who love their enemies. God is the father of those who love their enemies. This is stated in Luke chapter 6, verse 35. But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. So this is very similar to the scripture we read earlier about God being fair and equal to the kind and the evil, the good and the evil. And fourth, God is the father of the peacemakers. God is the father of the peacemakers. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So God is the father of those who want to make peace, who make peace with each other. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. So when you think about this, is this is very difficult, right? God is the father of those who love their enemies. God is the father of those who uh, make peace. So can God really be our, our father? Very difficult to think so and believe so. And then fifth, God is the father of those who are set apart. God is the father of those who are set apart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 through 18, Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So God is saying right here, come out and be separate from the world. Then I will be your father. That's why we have to live a life that is uh, sacred, that is set apart from the world. And sixth, God is the father of those who have been born again through the word. God is the father of those who have been born again through the word. James chapter 1 verse 18 says, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we will be a kind of first fruits among his crea cre creatures. So God allowed us to be first fruits, fruits. We are reborn. So we must be reborn. That way we become the sons and daughters of Christ, of God. And seventh, God is the Father of all who are led by the Spirit. God is the Father of all who are led by the Spirit. This is in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We must always go and live the uh, live according to where the Spirit leads us. So, are all of these things easy for us to keep? It's kind of difficult, right? I mean, imagine. It says here, love your neighbors or love your enemies. That's hard to do, right? So how do we know that God is really our Father? Let's say this is the middle, midpoint. Many people are right here in the middle. And over here, 
let's say, are 100% people who are full of faith. They are people who are full of the word. They 100% love their enemies. And they make peace with everyone, etc. So let's say that's here, right here. So uh, uh, in other words, this is Jesus. This is Christ. And then let's say the opposite end of the spectrum is the complete opposite. Those who live uh, against the word, those who disobey the word, who, who are always at war with others. So let's say that we are right here in the middle, right? But Christ, Jesus Christ, is the path for us to become perfect. So he's like a little door. And we have to go through that door and this journey to become 100% perfect in the word. This journey is what we're doing right now, the life of faith, what we're going through at this moment. So although we may not be able to be 100% perfect, you know, we fall, right? But we are in this progress, in this process of being reborn, of, of being disciplined to try and get to that 100% holy, 100% Christ, basically. So this process, as long as we are in this process, that we are always constantly working to become perfect this itself the that we are in the state this is what god acknowledges as sons and daughters of christ uh, of god then god will acknowledge you as his sons and daughters but many saints worry because they think they go back and forth it's kind of like a stock. You know stocks. They go up and down. But you kind of have to look at the overall. If you look at it overall, the stock, even though it comes up and down, the stock you can see over a span of long period, it's increasing. Little by little. So that's kind of like the faith that we need to have, the life of faith that we need to have. Even though we go back and forth, we need to always be constantly fighting ourselves and try to discipline ourselves to become that perfect image of Christ. So that the fact that we are always doing that in that process, then God acknowledges us as his children. Then what is the proof? So Father is always leading us, right? And he's working for us. And we can do it through his Christ, right? But how? This is in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. For those whom the Lord he loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as, his, as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegit illegitimate children and not sons. So God's children, he will discipline. This discipline is not just for fun. God is trying to train us so that we can be a perfect image of Christ. He's doing it for a purpose. And this is straight proof that we are God's children. Of course, not, not only us. People of this world, they all have their difficulties and struggles, right? But the difference is that we have faith. While others don't. But for us, we have faith. We say amen. And then we lead and we overcome. And then when we do, we are disciplined. 
and we are perfecting ourselves. We are fixing ourselves so that we can slowly s become that perfect image of Christ. So I pray that you believe that the, in this word. So even though it's hard, come to church, praise, receive the word. This is God's love and his grace. Right now, you guys are all receiving this love. So no matter what hardship come our way, please do not give up. Because this exactly is God's grace and his love for you. So please be true saints who overcome and believe that God is constantly giving us this hardship to discipline us. So please believe that. I pray this upon the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, who is full of love, we thank you. Through this Wednesday service, you have enabled us to once again think about your word and have hope. Father, we pray that we can always endure through and believe, knowing that you brought Jesus so that we may believe in him and we may become perfected through him. And Father, we pray that you may remember each and every one of our Evergreen Church members and their family members, that we may all be filled with your grace. May all of our hopes and our prayers be answered at this time. And our living Father God, may we believe in you and live according to to your living word and at this time we'd like to give back for all things that you do through this small offering may you return us with much of your blessing and your grace and we pray all of this in the name of jesus christ amen let us give glory to god with our applause